15 teach out of the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter number 15. Now, we're going to read a lot of scripture tonight, so be patient with us. Amen. Luke 15, chapter 3 through 32. And I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of the word, if you would. Then Jesus told them this parable. Actually, there's three parables, and they're in succession, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after it, the lost sheep, until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In that same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth. He squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. Isn't it funny how the famine doesn't come when you got something? <laughs> the famine waits till you have spent everything. And he began to be in need. And there's no kind of need like somebody who's not used to being in need. They don't have the mentality, the endurance, or what have you. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. He lost everything and now no one gave him anything. Isn't it funny when you lose everything, people won't give you anything? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, somebody knows what I'm talking about. If you got something, people will give you something, but if you lose everything, people won't give you anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I know what I'm going to do. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like, like, like make me part of the hired help. Make me a servant. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast, throw a party, have a celebration. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older brother was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on in there? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he, had, because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, oh hater. Mm -hmm. So his father went out and pleaded with him. 
But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Can you say amen? amen. The subject tonight is Operation Restoration. Operation Restoration. Type it on the line, Operation Restoration. Now, if you haven't lost anything, you don't need anything. But if you have lost in any area of your life, we are coming into a season of restoration. I, I just believe it. How many folk believe it with me? Yes, yes, yes. Look at somebody and holler at them and say, this is Operation Restoration. This is Operation Restoration. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Well, Lord, Operation Restoration. When you, th when you think about God, uh, he, is, he is a restorer, or no, nobody would be saved. Uh, he, he cares about us no matter what state we're in. The, the coin is lost, the son is lost, and the sheep are lost. And I thought, I thought when I was thinking about tonight that we would talk about these three different types of loss. That we would talk about the son being lost because so much is being lost in our house. Mm -hmm. Relationally. And we seemingly, we know how to have church, but we don't know how to have life. That's right. <laughs> You know, that, 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 that sometimes church becomes a narcotic that we take to anesthetize the pain from a house that doesn't work, okay? And then you come into a church to escape an environment that reminds you that maybe things are not so cool between you and your daughter or you and your son or you and your spouse or you and your mother or you and your sister or you and your coworker or you and your choir member. Because when you think about it, to me, the prodigal son story is about relationships. So I want to start there. The economy of relationships. The, the, the bankruptcy that is experienced in this text is the devastation of a home. It's not about money alone. Now, Jesus speaks about it metaphorically, pointing towards souls being saved, but I want to use it very practically, the bankruptcy of a home, where, where much has been invested and much has been squandered, and the son finds himself in a position of loss. What do you see when you look at the text? Well, in your original statement, Bishop, when you were talking about bankruptcy, um, we think of the economy of God, that there's never anything that goes to waste. And so if the father sacrificed to give the son this portion out of order and in the wrong season, he still manages to salvage enough so that the son can come back. So that there is a, a relationship, even though he's embarrassed, but shame doesn't mean much when it comes to love and grace. And so he shames himself again because what's after one shame, what does it matter? He gathers up his robe and runs down the road to receive him. Right. So all of that is a, an affront to his dignity. But the assault of one member of the family against others is the pain. You know, I, I thought about the, 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 the there's always somebody that you love that won't listen. <laughs> you, 
you, you could save them so much trouble if they would just listen, but they just will not listen. There's always that person uh, that you're in a relationship, maybe a friend, maybe a daughter, maybe a spouse, maybe a, a parent, grand, doesn't matter who it is. They, they, they are determined to do it their way and they, they won't hear you until after they bump their head. And I think the, the prodigal son reminds us of the wisdom of, of, of waiting and, and, and the wisdom of timing and the wisdom of being sensitive to the fact that you're not ready yet. If God had meant for you to have it sooner, you would have it sooner. He knows when, he knows how, he knows who, he knows what's yours. And if it's yours, it's still gonna be yours. Yeah, to, to wait on it, the power of waiting, uh, the, 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 the power of allowing yourself to develop to the point that you can withstand the weight of the wealth of what God is about to lay on your life. Sometimes what God is about to give you is too heavy for you and you have to grow up something to be able to, to, to handle it. You know, several prostitutes later and, 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 and spent everything in the streets, uh, he has this, this powerful moment in the King James Version. I like it the way it says it. It says he came to himself. Mm -hmm. I think everybody has had that moment of illumination where you come to yourself, that aha moment, that wake up moment, that I've been thinking about this wrong. But he has the moment surrounded by pigs. Yep. He doesn't have it surrounded by a family. He doesn't have it in a safe place. Yeah. He has an awakening in a smelly place. Um, if Dr. James wasn't sitting here, I would say a funky place, but I don't want to do that. It, it, it's, it's a, it's, it would be inappropriate. Uh, but, but you, you know, disobedience has an odor. Yes, it does. Yeah, re rebellion puts off a smell and a stench. A stench. And, and you, can't, you can't lay with the pigs and come home smelling like perfume. Mm -hmm. So in my mind's eye, I picture what the Bible doesn't specifically spell out, but common sense tells me that if you're feeding the hogs, you smell like what you've been laying with. Yes. Still, he comes home practicing as he goes what he's going to say to his father. Now, you have to have been under authority to appreciate how you get ready, you know. Mm -hmm. I, this is what I'm going to say. I'm going to say when I get to the walk the door, and, and I'm going to say, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to try to make excuses, and I'm not going to try to justify myself. I'm just going to, I'm just going to throw myself under my, he's practicing, practicing on his way back home, which is, in itself reverence. Yeah. He knows not to approach the father unadvisedly, right. you know? And then the uncertainty of not knowing whether you'll be received has caused a lot of people to build a house in a hog pen. Because sometimes we would rather live with the pigs yeah. than risk the rejection. Yes. Uh, Y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. In the house. See, see, that really drove home because we have an aversion to rejection, especially if you've ever been rejected. And, and I've seen people move in with the pigs. Even though they had a place in the palace they, they were afraid of rejection so much so that they would rather put on the camouflage of a hog, a Hebrew boy playing with a pig. They don't even eat swine. Mm -hmm. So he's been doing cursed things and he smells like where he came from and the amazing grace of the father that you referred to in part is him running out there. But imagine putting your best robe on your stinky child. 
There's no baths mentioned, no soap, no water, no cleansing. And I think that's what God does for us with the propitiation of our sins, that he, he puts his righteousness over our filth and covers us. It, it wasn't like a jacket or a pair of pants or shorts, it was a robe. He covers our stinky stuff with his righteousness and as if it never were and, and puts a ring on our finger and kills the, the fatted calf and throws a party. My question, I wonder, is God testing anyone listening at me tonight to see if you are gracious enough to cover up somebody whose own stench is a result of the mistakes they made? Or do you need to do like my mama needed to do? My mama would talk to you all while she was whooping you. <laughs> you brought this on yourself. If you done what I told you to, you wouldn't be in this situation. I, I don't know which was worse, the talking or the whooping. Uh, because she had to talk to you. Oh, you ain't gonna cry. Yeah. You ain't gonna cry. You, you're not gonna cry. You know, and then when you start crying, stop crying, stop that cry. It's a, it, we have a reason to be schizophrenic, right. you know. Right. You, you know. But I wonder if we have people that we hold hostage while we enjoy a grace we do not exemplify. Because it seemed like to me, I'm a father, I would have wanted to at least say once, you know you could have saved yourself this trouble. You know you brought this on yourself. I tried to tell you this wasn't necessary. At least once, even if I said it under my breath, I'd have hugged you, I'd have hugged you, but I'd have wanted to say one time. But I think the challenge in restoration, if we're gonna see healing in our homes, is the power of silence. The, the power of, of uh, loving somebody when you have the advantage and they're at a disadvantage. I don't think we're going to see restoration and, until we can stop worrying about being right. So we pray and ask God to restore people to our lives that we're not ready to receive when they come back into our life. Okay, you, you, you shared a little bit about your testimony. How does that strike you about being received when you're at a place of disadvantage? Yeah, you know, the nature of forgiveness for it to really truly work is that you have to let go of your need for a different past. Uh -huh. Say that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The nature of forgiveness, in order for forgiveness to work, is that you have to let go of your need for a different past. See, to forgive means that I'm going to move forward, not from a place of what happened, but from a place of what can happen. Not from a punitive approach, but from an approach of possibility. And I think that's what the advantage of the text is. But to put myself in the prodigal shoes, because I've been there, to become conscious enough that you don't belong here, this is not the place for you, I've been there too. <laughs> and to get up in that filth and stench and have to walk back and let everybody see it yeah. uh, requires you to first forgive you. Yeah. And so when you see the son walking back, he has somewhat forgiven him enough mm -hmm. to say, at least let me go back and become a servant in my father's house and the respect for his father to at least say, you don't have to restore me to my rightful place. Mm -hmm. Just give me a place. I'll take whatever place. I'd rather be demoted than removed. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so, so the father's house had to be so amazing that being a servant in the father's house 
was better than being the Lord of a hog pen. Absolutely. There's this shifting in status because he doesn't ask to be a servant in the house. What, what's really translated is asking to be equivalent to a day laborer. So a day laborer is going day by day. They're not sure they're going to have work the next day. So it's a demotion in status. And he gives them the best robe, which means the most prominent robe, is the robe that's reserved for guests. So he does more than acknowledge him as a son, but he gives him status with the robe and authority with the ring and a symbol of freedom. You're not a slave with the feet. And th this is, I don't like these terms because they get a little confusing for me, but this is that prevenient grace, the grace you get that you don't ask for, that he gives to the son. Um, and it's amazing that, that the father is more concerned about the relationship than where he's been. You know, it, 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 it brings th that last thing. He's more concerned about the relationship than he's concerned about where he's been. That, that's a very powerful, powerful statement. Uh, and, and we would do well to take note of it because we, rather than to be a private investigator and to question somebody about where they've been, sometimes you can win the battle and lose the war. It's better to restore the relationship rather than to become the FBI and interrogate the, the person. Jump in, jump in. The son never gets to complete his argument. His, he practiced the speech, but before he could finish it, he starts receiving the benefits of grace. And this story is told in the context of Pharisees and scribes who have been criticizing Jesus for the scandal of his table fellowship of tax collectors and uh, whoever else. I don't remember who else, but whoever the people were he was hanging out with. So this is a way in the parable of saying these, these people represent the inauguration of the kingdom. Um, and the, Repentance comes up in these, you know, there, there's joy in heaven over repentance of a sinner. But repentance, not to be denied, is not the crux of either of these. Because we really don't know if the prodigal son is repentant or manipulative, because he knows what to say. But sonship, and better than sonship, is given to him without checking off a moral checklist and all the boxes. I gotta say one more thing. And that is, you were talking about he has to walk home, Pastor Phillips. It's speculated that, and we don't know, that the house, the father's house, was in a different place than his farmland, in which case he had to have all those people looking at him. But when he covered him, which is what Bishop is talking about, he protected him. So maybe forgiveness is not forgiveness if it doesn't have an element of protection. Ooh. <laughs> My God. I told you. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> oh, we got to let, well, that's a sea law moment. That's a sea. Forgiveness is not forgiveness. Maybe forgiveness is not forgiveness if it doesn't have a level of protection in yes. it. Yeah. Uh, that certainly stands up theologically with God who has protected us while forgiving us. Yes. God is not punitive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but for some reason, our religions, our theology, yes. based on our experience with relationship, yes. has convinced us that God is punitive. As a matter of fact, the, the, this text is teaching us that punishment doesn't work. Yeah. Jesus, God proved this in Isaiah, I think it's 57, Isaiah 57, if I'm wrong, it's okay. But Isaiah 57, uh, I think verse 17 and 19 talks about this, where the Lord says he's go, he, he punished Israel because of their wickedness, but he saw them afterwards. In other words, I punished you, that didn't work. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do instead is heal you. I'm going to restore you. And the way I'm going to restore you, he says, I'm going to create praise on your lips. So in that one, three verses of Scripture, you see the Lord saying to His children, punishment doesn't work, but restoration always does. Yeah. And so I'm going to heal you instead of punishing you, and that's going to be the way that you're going to be made whole and restored. Oh, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. 
it, it kind of collaborates with the, the text, the goodness of God leads to repentance. Yeah, but the repentance is for the Pharisees and the Sadducees, not really for the, uh, uh, I'm taking it metaphorically, mm -hmm. because they're the ones that are murmuring. Right. Like the apostate Israelites and, and the wilderness. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's really a message to them. It's sarcastic mm -hmm. that you're the ones that really need the repentance. You, you're the ones who the really need repentance. Faith. Which, which, I'm going to get there in a minute, but, but it also gets to the elder brother thing yeah. and that self-righteous arrogance that is so pervasive in Jesus' environment and also today and also in us when we get to be right. Yeah. Yes. When we who have been wrong mm -hmm. get to be right, we do not always mirror the mercy that we received. Yeah. Okay. When the Bible said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, and yet we have a propensity to be better at receiving mercy than we are at giving mercy. Yes. Yeah. Have you ever listened to somebody talking and you, you didn't say anything, but you thought, nah. I know you're not talking about that, <laughs> you know. Right. Have, have you forgotten? Do you have amnesia? Yeah. Have you forgotten where you came? And the same person who did the same thing, the same thing is on the phone calling, trying to kill the other person after God has been merciful. Paul said to comfort with the same comfort wherewith we have been comforted. Yeah. And, and I think that, that we have we are created in his image. And though the Father God is the star of the text, yes. we have a responsibility as a mirror not to send out a reflection that is different from the Father that we say we're close to. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what happened to Moses when he smote the rock the second time? He misrepresented God yes. yeah. and gave a blurred mirror, mirror image a reflection. In other words, Moses was angry, but God wasn't. Right. And, and he executed an anger that was hypocritical to the God he was supposed to reflect and consequently didn't get to go in himself sure. because he could not let go of anger or rage. This, this father, uh, I never really thought about what you said, that the son didn't ask for the robe or the ring, and yet he didn't and yet the father gives it to him. Yeah. And there, there is no kind of conviction mm -hmm. like the conviction you get when, when God has been good to you in spite of you. Yes. 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 Now, we, we don't, we don't, we, we have church people today. We don't really have a lot of saints today like, like old timey saints today. And it's not even smiled upon to be like that today. But I can remember when, when, the, when the saints would talk about being married to unsaved companions and how they would wear them down with goodness and had to sleep outside and, and cook, came in and cooked dinner. Now, now you don't hear that kind of talk today because we're church people. We don't, really, we don't really lay on the altar till enough flesh dies to take anything. We're, we're more trendy with the world and where the world is going than where the church would be because it's no longer fashionable to be forgiving. It's no longer fashionable to be merciful. It's no longer fashionable to be restorative. It's more fashionable to be punitive. It's more fashionable to get revenge. It's more fashionable to annihilate. It's more fashionable to be tough and strong and, 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 and vindictive and spiteful. And you can see it in our movies and you can see it in our literature and you can see it in our writing and our art is a reflection of the changing of our culture it's very fashionable yes. to be hostile it's not fashionable to be merciful and 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 i don't know what the times were like in jesus day if he had the galing winds of of culture beating against his back the way we do today, certainly not through the technology that we do today, but we are almost under pressure and belittled if we are forgiving. Yes, yes, yes. 
And our need to be accepted by people makes us misrepresent the love of God in the way we handle people because we want to be respected as strong and thereby applauded by others rather than to reflect God and win favor in the supernatural. Oh, I know you're going to write me. Don't write me. <laughs> write Dr. James. <laughs> the, the, the reason I chose this story is because we need textbook guidance in dysfunctional families. And I know the theological value of the text and the power of the text theologically, but, but practically from a family perspective, this family's like messed up, they're jacked up. Abusive. You, you know, you got brothers, you, you didn't miss your brother? You didn't miss your brother? Your brother that you thought could have been dead and he's alive and you're jealous? What has happened to this family that Jesus uses in this analogy? It would, we could leave it in the text as an analogy and direct it exclusively to the Pharisees if we didn't see the same family characteristics emulated in our own families. Yeah. We don't all have siblings that miss us. Or worry about us. Or are glad to see us celebrated. Mm -hmm. He refuses to come in. He refuses to come in. When you think about the elder brother, on one hand, he has a lot of pluses. He, he, he has always done the will of the Father. He has been consistently uh, dependable. Uh, he has stayed in place when others walked away. He has been uh, uh, loyal in that regard. And outwardly, he looks amazing. But inwardly, he is bitter and spiteful and jealous and envious. And it reminds me a lot of times about self-righteous people. Outwardly, they look amazingly. But when you really get to know them inside, they are full of dead men's bones, which is what Jesus said about the Pharisees. You know, you're outside, you look wonderful, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. Now, the, the, the elder brother might not have been stinking outside, but he is pure old D rotten on the inside. Anytime your little brother that could have been dead is now alive and you're not, and you're so busy being jealous that you can't even come on the inside, that says something about your integrity. And if you take that and you're listening at me right now, it's easy to rate that at somebody else uh, rather, to, 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 rather than to take a hole and pull it back into you. But all of us have people with, with which we have built up walls of resistance that do not reflect the mercy and love of God. And what good is our theology if it doesn't act out in our behavior? If people cannot see Jesus in you, if, if they cannot see him, in, 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 I'm not talking about the way you dress and the way you wear your hair. I'm talking about in the way that you love, the way you treat people, the way you interact with people. If, if they can't see the personality of God reflect, they, they, without opening their Bible, Paul said that we are living epistles read of men every day. So that means the people at work should be able to read you and see Jesus. That means your unsaved children should be able to read you and see Jesus. Not in how puritanical you are, but in how you reflect the fruits of the Spirit, not just the gifts of the Spirit. And yet we have a generation of people who would rather camouflage their lack of fruit with more gifts. 
I, I can sing, I can prophesy, I can preach, I can do this, I can quote scriptures, I do this, I went to school. We have replaced fruit with gifts. But, but I can give you a gift and it doesn't have my DNA in it. But, 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 but if you're fruit, you have to carry DNA from the root. So a gift, there are gifted people in the nightclub. There are gifted people in the street. There are gifted people sleeping up under bridges. There are gifted people. And sometimes there are nicer people in the nightclub than there are in the churches. I, I know y'all don't want to say that, but, but, but that, I, I've been both places. I've, I've been both places. I know what I'm talking about. There, 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 sometimes you can find more loyalty amongst heathens than you do amongst brethren. And, and, it, and, and it's, it's sad, but it's true. And, it, what, and we're reaping the consequences of it in our families because quite frankly, sometimes we're just hard to live with. And whenever there's a good moment, we won't come into the good moment. Yeah. What do you think? Now, now, your background's largely theology, but it's also psychology too. What do you think about the older brother the inability, let's not just talk about the text, but the inability of people to celebrate other people. I, you said something, you say so many things that are so powerful, but in the service, in your sermon the other Sunday about we have to take all of people, how we can't fragment them and take pieces. The son, the older son says to the father, your son, talking about the prodigal, and the father comes back and says, your brother. Yeah. That those relationship circles, you just can't take a piece of it. Yeah. But while he's my son, he's your brother. And t the older brother is really the one, I know you don't want to go theology, but in the pig pen, he's, he's got the stench that is not satisfying. Like the prodigal couldn't eat the pods because it yeah. wouldn't satisfy his hunger. The older brother is functioning on merit and reward. I deserve this because I did these things and reward. And grace and relationships are not based on merit or reward. Um, and so we never know if he goes in. So he is the lesser in terms of the model because we know the prodigal son comes back. Yeah. But we don't, we don't know what happens to him. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's very interesting. The younger brother, in spite of all of his faults and his stench, he did go into the celebration. The elder brother, in spite of all of his piety and his faithfulness, uh, he, he never went in. And, and, and I think one of the things God is teaching us is that unforgiveness, hostility, anger, and resentment will lock you out of the party. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the economy of merit will always cause you to go bankrupt in your relationships. Mm -hmm. But that's the culture that we have, Yeah, this meritocracy, um, that I get it based on what I've done, what I've accomplished individually. And that was the mindset of the elder brother. But God operates from an economy of grace, mm -hmm. which is totally different from this economy of merit. And so when he sees his, his brother, who is quote unquote wicked, receive this grace and honor, how can he end up here and not be bankrupt? Yeah. <laughs> how can he end up here and be this blessed and be this received when he didn't earn it? <laughs> right, 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 right. And because he didn't earn it, yeah, he yeah. shouldn't get it. Right. But if God operated that way, nobody in this room, nobody watching online would be able to lift their hands and say, thank you, Lord. They wouldn't be able to say, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where, where would I be? Let's go deeper. <laughs> I, 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 love, I, I love this. I love this. Let's, let's play with this a little bit deeper. The meritocracy is a huge subject. It's absolutely right. And it's very, very, very important. And, and, and like blood pressure, high blood pressure, it's a silent killer. 
of relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't deserve the wife I could be. Yeah. Let, let me bring it where they can get it. Yeah. yeah, you don't deserve the wife I could be. You, you, you don't deserve the husband I want to be. You, you don't deserve it. So I purposely withhold from you and I won't go into your party and I won't celebrate you and I won't give you what you need from me because you don't deserve it. A meritocracy a mentality leads us in, in the seat of judgment and withholding ourselves to the, to the detriment supposedly of the individual, but it boomerangs and backfires and it's to the detriment of the individual because, because you, you need to come in to this celebration. It would make you better. It would make you whole. It would make you uh, the bigger person. But because you see love as transactional mm -hmm. uh, rather than experiential, you, you, you're waiting on me to earn what you should just be, because that's who you are. You, you are my brother, you are my wife, you are my husband, you are in love. So you, no need you acting mad, because you are in love. So just be what you are. Yeah, and if there's any fluctuation, let me come to myself, but, but you, you, your getting out of place doesn't put me in place. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> And, and I know we got two more stories and we're still stuck on the first one. But, but, but let me just touch on this other thing that, that screams at me out of this text. Is this unused favor that the elder brother has had all of this time that is pointed out to him by the father in the yard? You, you, you feel it? You feel it? You feel it? Jump, jump in there. Okay. Both sons are abusive. Mm -hmm. And this elder son, he doesn't even say father. He just says, look. It's like when your kids say, what? Yeah. You go, Why are you talking to me like that? Yeah. And, but the father receives this son with the same favor he received the other son. And he tells them, he gives them a different scale that it's not merit, but it's presence yeah. as opposed to distance. He said, you've been here with me. And so sonship is now defined in terms of being in the presence of the father. In his presence, I'm a son, not because I did all the moral things right, not because I did this. And then he get, makes him a joint heir. He said, everything that's mine is yours. And, and so we, we have this marvelous, um, he has the robe, he has the sandals, he has a ring that we killed a fatted calf, but look at what you have. I've shared fully with you. And that's what we have with the father. Yeah. That's the favor that's staring at us and we just to be in his presence. And, 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 and to me, the, 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 the needless frustration of the elder brother is that he is blaming the father for not giving him a calf or a goat to offer, to have a party with his friends. When the father is saying, you could have had whatever you wanted. But it's yours, it was already yours. And I wonder how many people live their lives with a God who has left you with a blank check and, and you're waiting on him to, to, to bring you a goat when he's saying all that I have is thine and, and you're living beneath your privilege and you're, you're frustrated and you act like God doesn't hear you and God doesn't love you and you become a hater of other people because you, you, you have this unused inventory of grace and favor that's been allocated to you just because you're in his presence, but you fail to take advantage of it and throw your own party. Throw your own party. Throw your own party. You, you got a MasterCard, you got a Visa, you got an American Express from God himself saying, I got your back, throw your own party. But you're sitting up there frustrated and angry, waiting on the Father to give you something that he has already given you. So the, the Bible says that God has, that he has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness in Christ Jesus in the book of Ephesians chapter one, verse one and two. So God has already given it to us and we are asking God for things that he's already given to us.
and we're waiting on the party to begin. Don't get mad because I'm having a party when you could have had a party a long time ago. You know, don't be standing outside trying to boycott and pick it what, as I take advantage of the grace that's been given to me because while I was in the hog pen, you were surrounded by a grace that I had to come to myself to even recognize was available. And I'm wondering, are you really spending out of the reservoir of what God has allocated to you right now? Or are you suffering from the lack of something that you think God needs to do when God has said, all that I have is thine? You, you know, you, you could have had a party anytime you wanted to. Don't blame God if you don't step into a better attitude and start using what he has allocated for you in the way of grace. We got to move. We got to move because we got to get, we got to get these other two in here <laughs> and, and we can stay on this product of the sun. I can tell all day. I want to get to this woman and this coin and, and what she has lost economically. And she's lost it in her own house. Mm. And, and I, I don't want to deal with the, 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 the economic issue of working, of existing at a deficit. It, it, it's not gone. It, it, it's not spent. See, the particle sign spent he is. Hers is not spent, it's lost. Mm -hmm. And it's lost in her house. And the whole notion of, of the economic wherewithal, she has 10 silver coins and loses one. And the Bible says she lights a lamp and finds a broom. I'm not as interested in finding her coin as I am finding the light and the broom. Because if I can get the enlightenment I can get the coin, but I can't get the coin in the dark. Mm -hmm. So she lights the candle, finds the broom, and sweeps the house to find the missing coin. How much of our economic infrastructure is affected by things that God has given us, but we don't have the enlightenment to appreciate what he has done. And, and the dream and the vision gets lost in the house and you don't know how to get it back. My, my brother and I started a window and sidings company. And uh, the way I lost my car is I let them, uh, I signed my car over to the business because the business needed money and the car was paid for and I signed my car over to the business to get more capital and, and, and the business continued to tank and I lost my car. And I lost my car and ended up walking and catching the bus and being at an economic deficit, number one, because I had no business in the business. Because the business was my brother's dream, not mine. And it was his dream because my father had a dream of family businesses. And so my brother had that same dream and we were gonna go into business and God was at that time calling me into ministry. <laughs> yeah. And if I would have won at business, I might not have ever said yes That's right. to ministry. Once I said yes to ministry, he let me open up all kinds of business, do whatever I wanted. But he wasn't going to let me be Jonah and successful. Wow. So, so finding the light is just as critical as finding the coin. It's not always the what, it's the why. And, and if you're going to be economically empowered to get all that God has given you, and, and be a good steward of what he's given you because she had it, 
She lost it. She lit a light and swept for it. Never does it say she prayed for it. Yeah. And we're so busy praying for it that we don't light a candle and look for it. Be because, because we are taught to believe that there is, that God's promises are void of human responsibility. When in fact, the coin is hers, there's no dispute about that. And she had the coin and lost it, but praying for it didn't get it back. There, there has to be, the Bible said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. All of these things point to our responsibility, our fiduciary responsibility in being good stewards of what God has given us and our human responsibility to provide an alignment between our works and our dreams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She didn't just dream she got the coin back. She lit a candle and swept for it. What, what do you think about it? Either one of you, just. Well, you already underscored what leaps out, I think, for all of us, and that is the urgency of her action, that the light didn't just come on, that she lit the candle or lit the mm -hmm. And the urgency, it's the energy, the human agency that she used to do the sweeping. The, to look at this uh, parable in the context of the three, keeps us really realistic and pragmatic because there's no one to blame. The coin doesn't have to repent. We really don't know how it got lost. This coin is only worth one day's wage. So even if you have all 10, that's not a lot. But she makes it a priority to go after the small things, telling us, and it's, it's a unique scripture. This is not related to what you're asking me, but it's a unique scripture because it's either the only one or maybe one of two where metaphorically we have God being typified in a woman in the text. And she calls for her friends to celebrate just like the shepherd and the father, but to enter into that merriment, which is God's celebration, you have to know mercy, which is the care she shows in looking for that one coin. I love it. I love it. I don't, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know where to stagger at. Uh, I don't know whether to trip over the fact that this is one of the few cases in Scripture where God is represented in a female character. That's, 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 a, whole, that's a whole book right. by itself. Uh, or, or the day's wages and, 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 and the woman is given to valuing details, which to me is always a sign of greatness because the greater you are, the more you care about details. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Okay. Poor people care about results, end results. Just give me the money. Just give me the, the money. CEOs, executives, rich people care about details. How did we get it? Where did it come from? Did you log it? Where was it found? Until you care about details, God can't trust you with stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I found interesting out of the 12 things that you mentioned, there, 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 was, there was one thing that leaped out at me. The prodigal son could talk and the sheep could bear. The coin is the only thing lost that's silent. Yeah. No, no repentance. Now, Keeping it in, in the context of economy, then economy is silent. So if God wants to restore what you have lost economically, it may not make a sound. And the reason I think that has some merit for our consideration yes. is when the widow was about to bake a cake and die. Oh. The miracle was in the meal and the meal couldn't talk. When, 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 when the woman was married, uh, uh, when the woman was about to sell her sons, 
because of the famine, mm -hmm. the oil was in the house and the oil couldn't talk. And, and, and both of them paid off their debts through something that was speechless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that means that greatness could be in you and be silent in your house. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. And, and water to wine. Uh, talk to me. And water to wine. And water to wine. Same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. So, so it, you, 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 you can't look for God's economic blessing to be vocal. Be, be, because it can't, and it can't practice what it's going to say when it gets home. You have, the onus is on you to light the candle and sweep the floor because your next blessing may be muted. That's, that's black. Who am I talking to? I'm, I'm, I'm talking to somebody who, the little bit of things that I've been able to accomplish in my life were muted. I preached a message one time, I didn't know I was me. The reason I didn't know I was me is because what God had for me was silent. At least I couldn't hear it. And, and a lot of times what God has for you is silent until you get a revelation. And, but, 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 but what you said. But she what, knew it was in the house. She knew it was in the because house. Because the prophet said to the other one, he said, what you need is, she said, save a pot of oil. What do you have in your house? Yeah. So, so, so you have to know it's in your house. Okay, you have to know it's in your house. And we don't know that. And we weren't raised to think it's in our house. We were raised to think it's in other people's houses and they should give it to us. And we're fighting to get something out of somebody else's house while we're overlooking what's in our own house. But the other thing, when you said urgency, it brought to mind the fact that the candle that she lit wasn't like turning on a light. It, 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 it was an oil lantern That's or right. something like that. There was a time limit. And I want to spend just a moment yes. telling you there's a time limit and you can't wait too long in the dark wishing for this coin to manifest in your life that there's a, there's a window. There's a window of blessing. I, don't, I, feel, I feel almost prophetic. There's a window you got to get in. You got to jump in. And I'm not talking about age isn't the problem. Life is the problem. Life moves on. It, it, when I teach business seminars, I tell them if, if Harlan Sanders opened up KFC today, he'd go bankrupt. He would go bankrupt. At the time he opened it up, he became a millionaire because he opened it up when women were going to work and families still wanted home cooked meals and he provided a solution to a problem. And see, businesses that thrive provide solutions to problems. The only thing is the problems don't last. Mm -hmm. So if you don't hurry up and solve the problem, then it's gonna to cease to be a problem. Let me show you what I mean. If Colonel Sanders opened up a business today, they would wanna know, is it, can I get it gluten-free? I'm a vegan, <laughs> vegan, I don't eat meat. Uh, is it processed food? What did you feed the chicken with? I, I don't eat this, I don't eat starches, I don't eat potatoes. He'd go bankrupt today. He'd do better to open up a veggie bar. So your vision has a clock on it. You could run out of oil if you don't sweep this floor right now. Who am I talking to? So have you ever noticed how, I, I'm gonna bring you in in a minute, yep. or jump in whenever you get ready. <laughs> have you ever noticed how when people get older, they become more outspoken? Yes. Oh, Things right. you would never say at 20 I'm, or 30. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. <laughs> you know, I'm guilty. I, I am afraid. I'm about to put a code lock on my lips. <laughs> because the older I get, the quicker I will tell you right. with straight no chaser, <laughs> just right 
now and walk off while you are shocked. <laughs> yeah. But the reason that old people get to the point quick is because you start to realize I'm running out of time. You don't have and I don't time. have time to play games. And I don't have time to worry about how you feel about it. I don't, I, don't, I don't have time to give you a back rub to give you the truth. You asked me what I thought. This is what I think about it. And this is what's going to take to straighten it out. And you better get up and do this right now and get up out of my face because I'm through with this. Because at 40, I, I had more time and I could approach it and I could drop hints and leave breadcrumbs in the forest and hope you found them before the birds ate them up. But at 60 something, I got to go ahead and tell you right now, you know, because I don't have time to worry about it. And, and to somebody tonight with this whole thing about economics, you're running out of time. You're running out of excuses. And, and you need to understand that the coin is in your house, but it can't talk. You have to light a candle and sweep the floor to get what, what you need to have and what you lost and what is rightfully yours. In her case, what had been given to her. In, in your case, it may be generational blessings. Some of the blessings I have right now, I believe belong to my grandfather, who was murdered at 22 uh, in Mississippi. And my grandmother, they brought him home in barbed wire, having bled to death in, in the water, and he never got to live his life out. And, and I believe that the blessings that I have come all the way back through my ancestry and through slavery and through all of the unpaid wages that everything God promises, yea and amen. And I believe in generational blessings that are going to pass from generation to generation to generation. And all of your inheritance wasn't handled by a lawyer, but there is a just God in heaven who is a just God who will make you make you good, set you straight, bring things in order so that you can live without guilt. This woman lit a candle, swept the house, got the coin, and then threw a party. The one thing all three of these stories have in common is that they celebrated what they had achieved and they had friends who were glad for them. Whether you're talking about the lost son, the lost coin, or the lost sheep, each one of them surrounded themselves with people who were party ready. <laughs> and I'm wondering, are there any people around you to call if you win? Do you have a group of people surrounding you that are glad to see you get your son back, get your coin back, and then the final thing, get your sheep back? I, I, we're running out of time. I want to touch on this lost sheep. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, the sheep. I'm going to back all the way up to David when he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And even further still, the Bible said that the heavens are telling the glory of God so that we learn God before there was a Bible through things. So David's first revelation of God, illumination, lighted, candle, was through his job. When he says the Lord is my shepherd, he's, he was saying the Lord is to me what I am to the sheep. So with no Bible in his hand, out there shoveling sheep dung, he has an encounter with God where he sees himself as the sheep and God as the shepherd. And, and what's so amazing about it is David is such a good shepherd, speaking of protection, mm -hmm. that he is able to kill a bear. I, I wouldn't shoot a bear with a 22. No doubt. <laughs> okay. Because the bear's going to keep coming. I wouldn't be happy with a nine millimeter, you know, because that might not be enough. If I shoot a bear, I want to shoot a bear with something that's going to suck. David killed a bear 
with a rock. And the bear had a lamb in its mouth. And he got the bear and saved the lamb. He, he killed a lion without ripping the flesh of the lamb it held in its mouth. When David says, the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> my, my, my. <laughs> He's saying that God is so accurate wow. that God will annihilate the biggest enemy that comes against you <laughs> that has snatched you and put you in its mouth. And yet God will take some small thing and annihilate him without endangering you. Even though you were in its mouth and you could feel the moisture of its mouth and the sharpness of its teeth up against your flesh, and even when it's gone that bad and you're that close to destruction that God is still able to snatch you out of it in time. There are some people in this room right now, you were so close to destruction, so close to suicide, so close to being destroyed that people just counted you as dead but God was so good with his slingshot that when he threw it, not only did he kill what was after you, but he got you out of its mouth without it destroying you, which would be a natural reflex of killing it. If you kill something and it's got something in its mouth, the natural reflex would be to clamp down on it. But God is so good at protecting you that he won't even allow the natural reflex of killing your enemy to be the consequences of defending you because he's still gonna bring you out of it okay. I don't know who that's for. I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know whose mouth you're in, but God said his aim is so good that you don't have to worry about it. It is from there that David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. <laughs> you, you should see the way you're looking at me. <laughs> he making me to lie down in green pastures. Yes. He leads me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. All of those he, 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 my, my cup runneth over. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I've been in the shadow. I've been in the mouth of the lion. I've been in the mouth of the bear. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yea, though I felt its teeth in my side. I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Come <laughs> on. I'll go anywhere if you go with me. Yes. Wow. <laughs> you know, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Yeah. Thy rod because you can beat back the wolf. Thy staff because you can pull me back when I go too far. Now bring it full circle, Bishop, because right there is celebration after that. Mm -hmm. Just like in all the other stories. Yeah, yeah. Because when he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies, I can celebrate the fact that I'm not the meal on the table, but I am celebrating. Come on, somebody. Because he snatched me from the bear's mouth. Yeah. My God, I feel like running up in oh, here. Yeah, yeah, Lord, yeah. Have mercy. So what you are saying is you went from being the meal to eating the meal. And this whole thing started because Jesus was at the table with the wrong folks. So it was the t scandal of the table oh, that scandal. it started with. <laughs> and then he ends it with his disciples with the scandal of the table. The scandal Washed of the table. Washing the feet. Good God of mercy. This is getting good to me. Is this getting good to y'all? If this is getting good to you, type something on the line. So, uh, so a seat. 
God is saying that you're going to go from being the meal to sitting down at the table eating the meal. That the story starts with you in the mouth of the devourer, but you're going to end up eating in the presence of your enemies. I don't know who that's for, but you need to receive that in your spirit. It, whoever that's for, just lift your hands and receive it. So all of that is said to introduce our text. <laughs> the man has 99 sheep. And, and one of them has gotten away from the herd. What, 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 do, you, what do you see? How relentless God is to come after you. God said, Jeremiah, what do you see? He, he said, I, I see this, this almond tree budding, blossom, blooming. And God said, you've seen well, for I will hasten after my word. I'll come after you. I'll come after you. I'll chase you. And for him to leave the 99 just to get you? Yeah. Brings us back to that place of gratefulness and thankfulness that he came for me at my lowest. Ooh. See, when you say that, I think he is the aggressor. Yeah. Uh, I, I am uh, the submissive one. He is the aggressive one. And it takes me to Song of Solomon. Have you seen my beloved? Tim. Behold, he cometh to me skipping across the mountains. He peers at me through the lattice. All right. Look at that. And he says, arise and come away. I have found him whom my soul loveth. Why should I look for another? He, he, he is the aggressor. He comes to her bedchamber. He came for the sheep. No wonder Jonah says, salvation is of the Lord. David says, his right hand, a holy arm, has gotten him the victory. Because God's saying, you are not here because you came for me. You're here because I came for you. Yeah. Can we back up for a minute, though? Because I think if we go to the rescue before we create the crime, we will have failed to deliver the fullness of the text. The first crime that created the chaos of the scene was leaving the herd. Had the one lamb stayed with the herd, had the one coin stayed with the nine, <laughs> had the prodigal son stayed at home, he wouldn't have got in trouble. When the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, it does it for a reason. Because we're safer together than we are by ourselves. Every one of these instruments in the text is violated by separation. Mm -hmm. The strength of the herd, they say, they say that the penguins stay alive in the North Pole because they get so close together that the body heat from one heats the other one. And as long as they stay in close proximity, though it's 20 below zero, they survive through their connectivity. If, if we touch and agree on anything, it shall be done. Mm -hmm. But the one sheep has gotten beyond reach and thereby fallen into peril. And I just wanted to add that before we rescue it, let's explain how the enemy wants to pick you off by isolating you. 
they, they say, Dr. James, when, 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 when a sexual predator is grooming a child, the first thing they do is to separate them from everybody else and tell them what's wrong with them and she doesn't really love you and she doesn't care nothing about you. I'm the only one who's really there for you. Or an abusive spouse will do the same thing, cutting you off from everybody else until I'm the only source, I'm the only one that thinks anything of you. You're stupid and you're dumb and you're ugly and I'm the only one that has any use for you and if you don't stay with me. See, what they're doing is separating you from the herd. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because as long as you got a herd, you, you can handle the wolf. <laughs> but but this, this poor sheep has gotten away from the herd. Maybe there's somebody listening at us right now that the enemy in some way has allowed you to separate from the herd. Somebody hurt your feelings. Somebody said something to you. Somebody didn't like your dress. Somebody sang your song. They took their song away from you in the choir. You got mad, you walked away. You, 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 I'm your only pastor. You don't fellowship with anybody. You don't go to church. You don't do anything. There is strength in the herd. Yes. There is strength in being unified. There is strength in being together. The Lord wouldn't have to be the aggressor in the text if the sheep would have stayed together in the fold. It's supposed to incidentally be a hundredfold. And the value of the one sheep is that if it's not a hundredfold, 99 won't do. So the, 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 the fold is devalued by the loss of the one. We need you in your place. It not only affects you, it affects us. We, we, we can't go to market without you. We, we, we want to be a hundredfold. We want to be a full flock when we go to market. But we need you to be with the herd. So you have to lose your anxiety, lose your inhibitions, lose your insecurities, get rid of a degree of your introvertedness enough to allow you to coalesce with us because we have an enemy that's trying to kill us. Am I helping anybody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, do either of you, go ahead, you look like you the, want to say That 99 in one translation was left in the open country. So while the one that went astray was at risk for a predator, so was the 99 because the shepherd had to leave. Yes. And in, in the first century, when all of this was, was kind of going on, shepherding had become a devalued vocation. Mm -hmm. It was like being a sailor or um, a gambler or whatever. And yet there is esteem now being given to the shepherd who goes after the others. And you're so right, it's not the whole 10 coins, it's not the whole family without Johnny Lou or whoever, with that we have to have that corporateness and the power of corporality. We come together. That, 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 that whole, we, we, we can do this all night, we, we, we got to stop. The, 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 the whole corporate thing, you're, one can chase a thousand Two can chase 10,000. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't make sense mathematically because if one could chase 1,000, two should chase 2,000. But God says, I will give you exponential increase. Yeah. While you're doing math, I'll do algebra. I'll take you into the next round of blessings if you can learn to get along horizontally. You cannot just have a vertical relationship with God and not develop your skills horizontally because you decrease your ability for exponential increase and you open yourself up to an attack that you would never have to have and you put the 99 at risk, at risk. as Dr. James has said, and you also have to create the shepherd, as uh, Dr. Phillips has said, having to come and get you when the shepherd shouldn't have to come and get you if you would learn how to, to flock together. But you've always been such a loner. You've always done things on your own. You've always danced to the beat of another drummer and you're missing the collective vision of the church 
re requires that you put that aside so that you can become bigger, uh, become a part of something bigger than yourself. Who am I talking to tonight? So young people often ask me, why should I join the church? I just go wherever I want to go. I come, I don't want to be joined to nothing. I don't believe in anything. I don't want to be joined. I want to be joined. This, one, this sheep didn't want to be joined either. That's how it ended up in trouble. There's something that happens when you are a part of something. Yes. Whether it's a part of a family or a part of 10 coins or a part of a hundredfold, there's a safety and connection that you wouldn't have on your own. I'm wondering tonight if there's, if there's some predator that is trying to isolate you so that he might destroy you. That first you just don't feel like going and you're just tired and you just, and, and then secondly, he'll bring up, they looked at you funny last time you came to church and they, I heard they said something about you and so and so is not right. And whatever they're using as a tool, don't you see that they're trying to lure you off to yourself so that they can destroy you without anybody noticing that you're gone? It's, it's, it's a process that they call grooming. Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to, not, not say for you first, to have you. It's one thing to sift you, it's another thing to have you. Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as sweet. But I prayed for you that your faith fail you not. And this is how I'm going to know that my prayers have worked and they're going to work. He didn't say if. He said, when thou art converted, you will strengthen the herd. <laughs> as long as you're not converted, you're going to stand in isolation by yourself. And you're going to blame everybody else for why you can't get along with anybody. And it's always going to be about them and not about you. And everybody was wrong but you. And nobody got you and nobody understood you. But when thou art converted, I will know because you will strengthen the herd. You will come back into cohesiveness and you will be restored. As we close tonight, I am praying that a spirit of restoration would rest upon you tonight. I am praying that you would make noises, kick, squall, yell, holler, whatever you got to do until the shepherd puts you over his shoulders and brings you back to the herd because he's been looking for you, because he's been longing for you. You've got a shepherd that's looking for you and a devil that's looking at you. Satan has desired to have you. He's been standing over in the corner saying, oh, I could really work on that. He's been lusting at ways he could destroy you, that he might sift you as sweet. And he would have already done it, but the good shepherd prayed for you. He didn't pray that you wouldn't fail, but he prayed that your faith wouldn't fail. Because he already knew you were going to fail many times, Peter, but there's a difference between you having failure and your faith failing. When thou art converted, I will know you're converted by your ability to come back to the herd. 
The shepherd goes out there, he gets the sheep, and he brings him back to the herd and then throws a party because they're reconnected. The dry bones in the valley could never fight an army because they were disconnected. You staying disconnected is killing you. And this is the word of the Lord to you tonight. Whether you're a coin that slipped down in the sofa somewhere, or whether you're a restless, impatient son who rambunctiously spent your father's living in riotous living, or whether you're a sheep who just wandered away and don't even know what day you left and don't know where you are and don't know how to get back. The prodigal son knew how to get back home, but sheep don't even know how to get back home. The coin couldn't even cry out, and yet all three of them were found. So whether you are silent as the coin, or lost as the sheep, or awakened like the sun, the ending is always the same. Come home. 